will now have a valedictory from my good friend, the member for South Perth. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The voice of reason is standing now to uh, bring some order to the chamber. <laughs> and my family and friends up there, this is what it's like all the time. <laughs> a very unruly place. I've just found out, Mr Speaker, that I'm competing with the state of origin, third game, the decider. I've got friends texting me saying, do you mind if we don't watch your speech online? <laughs> <laughs> We've got to watch the, uh, the state of origin. And it's can one we, try can each. We watch it later? It's one try each. I said, I could go for your life. <laughs> um, Queensland have scored the first try, if no one knows. And New South Wales the second. OK, thank you. Uh, Mr Speaker, if anyone had suggested to me 20 years ago that one day I'd be standing here after nearly 16 years in this place giving a valedictory speech, I would have laughed at them. Uh, my life was completely different back then. I, I was a, a journo at the West Australian, uh, worked long hours, night shifts during the week, covering sports events on weekends, a few beers after the sports events, travelling regularly interstate and overseas to cover big sporting events. I had no time for politics and I really wasn't interested in politics. My politics, I had been a member of the Liberal Party back in the 80s when we lived in Ascot, and it was pretty tough out there in Belmont, being a member of the Liberal Party. And I do remember I said once, um, I was at a branch meeting and they were looking for candidates to go to state conference. Well, I didn't even know what state conference was. And um, I said, oh, yeah, I'll go, okay. So I turned up at the um, Sheraton Hotel and I'm a journo at the West, and we're supposed to be apolitical. I turned up at the Sheraton, and there's this uh, phalanx of, of, of reporters and cameras all waiting, all getting the, the, the delegates as they walked in. So I had to quickly walk past and, and find another entrance to the, to the conference. <laughs> but um, I was always a Liberal because when I was a kid growing up in Hemi Hill, I do remember Bob Menzies, and I was always pretty inquisitive, but. I was taken by his oratory style. And we only had a radio in the lounge room down in Hammy Hill. I mean, we didn't have much money, but um, we would listen to him. He'd come over and, and speak at the Perth Town Hall. And sometimes he would speak at um, the, the GPO uh, during the day and the night time they'd speak at the Perth Town Hall. And we'd sit around and listen to him on the radio. So I was sort of impressed with him. My dad was a Labor man. But I'm probably one of the few Liberals to come out of Hammy Hill. Um, but I've got to say, uh, you know, after the career I had, um, being a Member of Parliament is the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And I did a lot of rewarding things as a journo. I, I, I promoted good ideas and, and covered big events and tried to make the sports that I was covering better for the competitors and the, and the fans. But the job we all do uh, as members of parliament is, is so fulfilling and rewarding when you can help people in your electorate. And even in South Perth, people think it's a wealthy electorate. There are a lot of people in South Perth who live in homes, West Homes, and, and battle and, and struggle. And you, you, you help them whenever you can. And, and that's rewarding for me. So how did I become, how did I come to become the member for South Perth? Now, I haven't spoken about this much, but one day in 2004, I got a, a phone call from a, a person who will remain anonymous, who said, would you be interested in running for South Perth for the Liberal Party? I said, why do you ask? He said, um, they're having big problems with their pre-selection. It had become very untidy. The state director had to call in the police at the, at the pre-selection because... <laughs> because uh, I mean, bad behaviour doesn't just happen in Labor. I mean, it, it, happens, it happens over this side too. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and people on the pre-selection panel were being uh, uh, coerced about how they're going to vote and threatened and all that. So they arranged for me to have a meeting with a couple of the Liberal heavyweights. Um, one I knew, one I didn't, at a cafe at Scarborough Beach on a Sunday morning. My wife came with me. And they said, listen, we know you've, you're, you're a member of the party. Um, we're looking for someone who lives in South Perth. We're having problems with the pre-selection. And um, 
would you be interested if we, if the State Council opened up the pre-selection again, would you put your name forward? So I discussed it with Karen. Karen had actually, she, she knows much more about politics than I do. She had worked for Wilson Tucky, for Iron Bar, and, um, and she encouraged me to give it a go. Uh, we'd not long been back in Perth after I did five years in Melbourne, best five years of a journalistic life. I was sports correspondent for the West Australian. But incidentally, this wasn't the first time that I'd been approached to throw my hat in the ring. Uh, back in the 1990s, um, Wilson Tucky and a fellow called Andrew Peacock, who I'm sure you've all heard of, um, spoke to me about standing for the federal seat of Swan, which was held by Kim Beasley. But the, the margin was diminishing for Kim, and he eventually went to another seat. And they said, well, you know, you should run against, uh, you should run for Swan. Because I'd lived in Belmont for 20 years. Uh, I had a reasonable profile in the media. Uh, I was well known in the racing industry. They thought I'd be a good, good candidate. But at the same time, uh, my career at the West was, was moving forward at a rate. Uh, I'd been moved over to cover AFL. I'd originally been a, a racing rider and they put me onto footy. They obviously identified I knew something about the great game. Uh, and um, I'd covered the Eagles two premierships, 92 and 94. And uh, my journalistic career was going pretty well. So I, I declined. But um, when the opportunity for South Perth came up, the situation was different. I'd been living in Como for about 12 years. I'd returned from uh, Melbourne, where I was basically my own boss. Went back to the old west, where people that I used to be senior to were now calling the shots. Um, my mail was getting sent back to Melbourne because they didn't even know I'd come back. Um, and I thought, well, this maybe isn't the place I want to be. So um, I took it up. My colleagues at the West couldn't believe it that I was going into politics. What they did say, though, when I did leave, they said, well, you're going into an early retirement. Nothing could be further from the truth because politics is a busy job and it's a tough job. But I was going for a job for, for, from a job where I'd been sports editor, I'd covered two Olympic Games, uh, 14 AFL Grand Finals, I'd voted on the Norm Smith Medal in 1993, won by Michael Long. I'd covered more than a dozen Melbourne Cups, five Australian Tennis Opens, a couple of Grand Prix in Melbourne, and numerous international golf tournaments. Now, why would you give up that life to go into politics? I sometimes, <laughs> I sometimes ask myself. Um, but my experience in politics also, as I said, had been almost non-existent. The only university that I'd attended was the University of Hard Knocks. I went to John Curtin until I was 16, got a job at the West as a copy boy. I was interviewed for the job by the late Tom Burke, uh, who had lost his job in, the, uh, in federal politics and the West Australian had given him a job in what was then called the staff office. Now, I reckon now Tom would have seen this young bloke from Hammy Hill and said, he's caught two buses to get up here for this interview. Why not give him a job? So I got a job as a copy boy, went to night school and the next minute got leaving English in another subject and um, I got a cadetship in journalism. So that was the start of it. Um, I, won the, I won the pre-selection from a very big field that included uh, a couple of former members of parliament who, who saw South Perth as a good seat. And um, my campaign committee included Karen, my wife, my good friend Phil Bruce, who's here this evening, uh, a work colleague, Barry Farmer, used to be chief racing rider at the West, good Liberal, advertising guru Keith Ellis, and our treasurer was Liberal Party stalwart Ted Gray. It was decided that our first fundraiser, uh, this was, this was um, recommended by Keith Ellis, who was an advertising guy. He said, why don't you have, have a fundraiser for a legend of South Perth in sport? So we'll have this big fundraiser and, and we'll, part proceeds will go to a sporting organisation, a junior sporting club in South Perth. So we had the first one, and it was so popular that we've had one every year since. And, you know, we've inducted people like Lynn McClements, a gold medal, medalist at the Olympics. She grew up in Manning. Uh, all these champion footballers grew up in Manning. Um, three hockey players. Andrew Vlahoff grew up in South Perth, went to four Olympics, went to um, 
at Kensington Primary School. Now all these people, and you know, it, it was just a good local thing to do, and, and I, I, I'm really pleased. And I want to thank uh, Phil Bruce, Steve Loxley, and Alan Chubby Styles is here, the great Alan Chubby Styles, who won a Simpson medal playing for Western Australia. Good friend of mine. He still hasn't forgiven me because in my my first ever campaign, I vowed to the people of South Perth that I would deliver underground power to the whole area. Now, he, Chubby lives in part of Kensington that still hasn't got it. And he, <laughs> so he, he reckons uh, he was going to run against me. There was, a, there was another time when uh, Jeff Gallup retired. I got on well with Jeff Gallup. He was adjoining seat, Vic Park. And um, we were looking for a candidate. And you know what happens in politics? You always say, oh, we can win this seat. I said, can we? Yeah, well, we can win it. And so I said, I said to Chubby Styles, I said, Chubby, I've got something for you. He said, what's that? I said, you played for Perth, you were at Lathlane Park. Um, everyone knows you. you, you're in the movie industry. Why don't you put your hand up and run for Vic Park? He said, I've got a better idea. Why don't I run for South Perth and you run for Vic Park? <laughs> So, so anyway, on the 26th of February 2005, I was elected to Parliament, the 37th Parliament, as only the fourth ever member for South Perth. Now, you might wonder about that, but South Perth wasn't a, didn't become a district till 1950. Before that, South Perth was in the city of Canning, because back before 1950, it was all bushland out through Manning and all those places. But in 1950, it became um, the seat of South Perth and I'm the fourth ever member and the second longest serving. My first election, uh, I, I got through, but, but you know, I was fairly new to the area. I got a 52.87 per cent primary vote. Um, then in 2013 was a different year. Um, I increased that primary vote to 66.97 per cent. And that was the highest of any Liberal that year. And I remember mentioning it in a speech and the, the then Premier was sitting down the front that I'd, I got the highest of any, of any um, primary vote of any Liberal at the election. He said, not a good, good career move reminding people that you got a better vote than me. <laughs> but I did. Uh, other members of the class of 2005 on this side of the chamber were Troy Buswell, very well known, John Castrilli, Murray Cowper, Dr Graham Jacobs, Tony Simpson, Gary Snook, Trevor Sprigg, and Dr Steve Thomas. Sadly, I'm the only one remaining, although Dr Thomas is now, he's come back and he's in the upper house. I especially say sadly, because in January 2008, I lost my very good friend and roommate here, Trevor Sprigg, to a heart attack. It was one, one of the saddest days of my life when I got a phone call from the, someone in the media saying Trevor had died in Fremont Hospital. Um, Trevor and I were like minds. We both loved East Fremantle Footy Club. Uh, he'd been a premiership player at that club and both of us didn't mind a bet on the horses. An old lady in South Perth said to me one day after I was elected, Mr McGrath, they tell me you're a punter. And I said, I'll tell you what, Mary, it's not illegal. I understand it's not illegal. And it's funny how people think, you know, because you're a punter. Well, you know, it's, I mean, it is a legal, legal thing. Um, <laughs> so I'm coming into Parliament... Uh, Trevor's, Trevor's wife, Lynn, asked me to deliver a eulogy at the funeral at East Fremantle Oval. I, I guess some of your members would have been there. Um, and after the, after the eulogy, the East Fremantle Football Club came to me and said, Trevor was a co-patron. We'd like you to take over with him. And, and I'm, I'm still now a co-patron of the Mighty Sharks. And we don't like South Fremantle that much, uh, Minister for Transport. Um, <laughs> so what did I do when I came into this place? I said, well... Um, I made a commitment that I would do the best for the people of South Perth, but also because of my journalistic background, I, I, I thought, you know, I want to try and make the state a better place. I remember as a journo, I, I went to Melbourne, and after footy matches at the MCG, all these kids had run out on the ground and they'd all be kicking the footy with their dads and all that. In Perth, at, at Subiaco Oval, they couldn't, wouldn't let them on the ground. So I wrote this column, I said, what a disgrace, you've got the MCG, one of the great stadiums of the world where kids can run on, and in Perth our kids can't. 
It was a no-brainer. It wasn't long before the Football Commission said, yeah, the kids can go on the ground. So I've always been inclined to want to make, make the world a better place if I can, because that's what a lot of journalists do. You know, we, we look at things and we write columns and, and think pieces. And... So um, I really believe that in my own small way, uh, without having any decision-making responsibility in government, I believe I've made a, dis a difference in, in some areas. I'm, I might talk about a couple of them. My first portfolio was uh, seniors, racing, gaming and liquor licensing. And some of my uh, colleagues very unkindly suggested that was a natural fit for me. I hope it wasn't, <laughs> I hope it wasn't the seniors. I, I prefer it to be the racing and gaming. And my first, first ever shadow I was shadowing the man who's now Premier, the member for Rockingham. Now, I thought the Premier for Rockingham might be an easy target, you know, like he, he knew... He, I didn't know much about him back then and he probably didn't know much about me. I certainly didn't know that he was going to be Premier one day, uh, but I, I thought he didn't know much about racing. <laughs> and so I used to try and trick him with questions, you know, across the chamber. And, um, but I didn't have that much luck with that. But. Um, I do take my hat off, and I've always believed this, the, the member for Rockingham was responsible for my first big challenge in this place when he brought in legislation to introduce small bars and allow liquor stores to trade on Sundays. Now, uh, he's the first person that I knew of, maybe Herb Graham was the previous one when he brought in taverns in the 80s, to take on the powerful AHA, a very, very, very powerful group. So I agreed with the legislation, but I had a problem. My party members had been lobbied very heavily by the AHA, who said small bars are going to send all pubs broke. Uh, they also wanted to hold on to the monopoly over Sunday trading uh, for takeaway liquor. So it was a difficult time for me because I hadn't been experienced taking legislation to our party room. And when you walk in and you don't know that half a dozen members are waiting to blindside you or ambush you, and that happens. And, and, and what, what, the thing about this place is you learn on the, on the go. You, you've got to make mistakes. And, and I, I could be a lot better member if, if I could turn the clock back 16 years. But it doesn't happen. There's no uh, rule book or you don't get tuition along the way because all your fellow members are um, they're all busy doing their own thing. You know, they, so um, it was a difficult time, but the deadlock was finally broken when Paul Omondi, our leader back then, made a captain's call to support the government's legislation. And I've got to say, uh, I became a bit unpopular with the AHA. I noticed the Premier now is boy number one with them. I don't know, <laughs> I, I don't know how you patch that one up with Bradley Woods, but... Um, and I haven't seen too many, clubs, uh, too many pubs close. The other thing I've always wanted to do was uh, greater use of the Swan River. Um, you know, I'd seen ferries in Brisbane and... Uh, tourist ferries and, and commuter ferries, and uh, I've always pushing for that. And, and I also came out with a suggestion that um, we should lift the causeway, because the causeway, I mean, you'd hardly walk under it, it's that low, and you've got to have those little flat bottom boats and, and low boats to get up the river. I thought, why don't we lift it, uh, you know, put a, and get bigger boats up into the upper reaches of the river? When I, I raised it and it, was, it made the papers, it, a bloke sent me a text saying, well, why don't you just lower the water? <laughs> <laughs> but under the Barnett government, I did get to chair, and that was through uh, the, the member for Burt, who was then the um, Transport Minister. Uh, I chaired a working group to look at creating more ferries. And we came up with, a, with that suggestion to uh, raise the causeway, but we also came up with a suggestion. I still believe it's a no-brainer, run a fast ferry from the Raffles Hotel jetty into Elizabeth Quay. With all those towers now in Applecross, people would walk down, jump on a fast ferry, rather than walk over the bridge and jump on a train that might be half full. So that's one for the Minister for uh, Transport, provided she doesn't become uh, Treasurer. <laughs> and if you do become Treasurer, you've got to hand over to whoever becomes Minister for Transport and tell them, South Perth train station. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Keep, keep it high on the list. I don't want to really lose you at this time, but can't stop progress. So I had another idea. One of my colleagues said to me, one of the, the, the 
federal colleagues who will remain nameless, he said, I can't get in the paper. I said, well, I get, a, I get a good run in the Southern Gazette and in the West. He said, you come up with all these wacky ideas. <laughs> I said, well, maybe you should come up with some wacky ideas. But, <laughs> but I, uh, there was, there was, the tourism industry was going through a difficult time and they wanted the government of the day to, uh, I don't know which government it was, it might have been uh, the Carpenter government or ours, um, they wanted uh, to, to get a holiday at home campaign going. And I said, well, you've got all this road reserve on freeways and highways. It's owned by the government. What about putting up some billboards? You know, holiday in Broome or holiday in Bustleton. And it didn't go that, down that well with members of the community who thought it would be a distraction. But I notice there are billboards now down on the Forest Highway, out at the Perth Airport. There's one as you drive up the freeway here above the Channel 9 building. I don't get distracted by it. And if you go to Melbourne, going out to Tullamarine, on the Tullamarine Freeway, there's a row of them. And it's government land. Easy. It doesn't cost anything, Premier. Uh, in 2009, I was appointed uh, chair of a joint standing committee to review the Racing and Wagering Act. Um, the member for Darling Range and also the speaker were on that committee. It was a very, very high-powered committee. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> No, Mick Murray wasn't on it. He wanted to be on, but he wasn't allowed to. <laughs> we banned him. They all want to get on committees with me. I don't know why. But I do remember the member for, the member for Darling Range uh, had never been inside a, a betting. She didn't know anything about betting. So the former member for Kalgoorlie, John Bolton, and myself, gave her a little bit of tuition. <laughs> we'd, we'd had lunch at this hotel in Kalgoorlie, and we took her into the betting place and told her all about it. Um, but the committee found that the racing industry was in need of infrastructure. They need a lot of money because a lot of the, the infrastructure in the industry uh, was tired and old and had to be replaced. And so we made a, a recommendation that the, the government should reduce the tax on wagering by a sufficient amount to set up an infrastructure fund. Now, you know what it's like trying to get Treasury to... to give back a bit of a tax that they've been getting for a long time, and it, it didn't happen. Now, I wasn't happy with that, so I came out and I gave a speech here and said, the only answer is to sell the tab. And uh, I said, because if you sell the tab, whoever, who's the successful bidder, they always put, give you money up front. And, and so that money, part of that money could be used, which the government was planning, uh, to set up an infrastructure fund. Uh, well, I had so much opposition. Um, the Nats opposed it. The Labor Party opposed it. Some of my colleagues opposed it. They were crossing the floor. And my friends in racing were saying to me, you've, you've sold out the industry that you love. You know, what are you doing? The, the TAB is the goose that lays the golden egg. But I knew that the, the climate was, was going to be bad because there was more competition coming from the big, the big boys from overseas. So... Um, uh, we, we stuck firm, uh, we tried to get it done and we ran out of time. 2017 election came. I think we lost that one. Um, I think we did. You did. And, um, but then, surprise, surprise, the, um, the new government, the McGowan government, made an announcement that we're now going to sell the tab. And I, I, I felt so vindicated, because at last I've got one right. And I could have politicised it. I did, say, um, I did say to the media, this is the biggest uh, backflip in the history of the Parliament of West Australia. It was, <laughs> it was probably close, but, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but as I've said in this, time bef in, in this chamber before, and the Attorney-General's mentioned it a few times, in politics, nothing wrong with doing a backflip, provided you land on your feet. You don't want to stumble, but if you make a good landing... Backflips are fine. And I, I didn't make it political. In fact, I supported the government because I knew the industry, it was best for the industry. And I think I'm one of the few opposition members that got mentioned in the official press release. <laughs> thank, thank the member for South Perth for his support. Yeah. Uh, but I, I didn't, didn't do it for the government. I did it for the racing industry because I felt it was right. My only worry, Treasurer, is that times have changed. I don't know what the tab's going to be worth when we finish COVID-19. If we'd sold it when you first suggested it, 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 when we first suggested it, it might have got seven or eight hundred million. But I can only hold you guys account for that. To account. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So my most, one of my most difficult decisions was when uh, my government decided to um, merge, amalgamate the two councils, South Perth and Vic Park. It was a very difficult time for me. Um, my community didn't want it. Uh, the people from Vic Park didn't want it uh, because they were going to lose Burswood and Crown and that was a lot of rates, about four million a year. Um, I ended up, uh, I went on, uh, went on the 7.30 report, it probably was another uh, not very good career move, and I, I said that the people of South Perth have been led up the garden path by my government. And I could imagine uh, the former Premier sitting at home in Cottesloe uh, with no air conditioning. Um, <laughs> what, what, watching the 7.30 report. And um, to his credit, Colin said, well, I don't mind you talking about your electorate, John, that's fine, but uh, I didn't like the language, some of the language you used in the interview. Um, and I also went to Vic Park. Um, there was a, a rally, and, and I remember the, the now treasurer was there, and he had a T-shirt on saying, Save Burswood, or Battle the Battle for Burswood. And um, Kate Douse, from the, the President of the Upper House, she was there too. And so I was the only lived there. And the media interviewed us afterwards, and so it's on Sunday Night TV. There's me with two Labor members. So I'm always getting into trouble about things like that. <laughs> but I did have... I, I think my, my finest achievement in this place was the stadium. Um, I, uh, I gave a speech one day. I was sitting up there. I was whipped. And the Premier was down the front. And, and I said that um, the stadium should go to Burswood. And my reason that it should go to Burswood, it was a greenfield site, but I had a bit more information. I had, I had a copy of the um, Stevenson report from 1955, who, one of my workers who's here today, Fred Kavanagh, who would, who would have a copy of the Stevenson report at home? Who? Only a bloke like Fred Kavanagh. He keeps all those things. And he brought it into me. And the Stevenson report in 1955 said um, that one day there will be need for a stadium to hold 80 to 100,000 people in Perth, and the best location is the Burswood Island, which was infield and all that. And he said it, they said it, it, it should be the site of a sporting uh, zone for all sorts of sports. So the Premier liked it, and he said, well, why don't we, we push that? And the rest is history, and the stadium is an amazing, amazing... Um, project that, that everyone agrees is really outstanding. So in closing, I want to thank all the people that have worked for me, all, all the people, uh, I want to thank my wife, um, Tower of Strength when I get home at night. She says, where were you today? I didn't see you in the chamber. I said, <laughs> I said, <laughs> and I'd say, uh, why don't you get a life? <laughs> Uh, but she's always the font of knowledge and, and she gives me good advice about politics, but I don't always listen. Um, my, my, my children, David and Erin, uh, great supporters of mine. Uh, my long-serving uh, staff members, Dawn Stratton, who's here, and Fred Kavanagh. Dawn was my electorate officer for uh, 12 years. Um, all my, my current staff members, Pierre Sanders and Frank Wright, all my staff who I've had over the years, and, and I've had some outstanding staff. I don't know why, but I think the member for South Perth's office is a, is a breeding ground for outstanding people. I've had four, uh, four university students who did law all go on to, to outstanding careers, in, uh, including president of the Law Society and, and ones in the, 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 the bar in New York. And these people have all come out of my little office in South Perth. So um, maybe it's not a bad training ground. Yeah. So I want to I want to thank all those people. I want to thank the community of South Perth. You know, South Perth people are good people. They, they don't complain much. South Perth people just get on and, and get things done themselves. You know, they don't come and want, want you to do everything for them. And but I've had I've had so much support from those people. And it's been a real honour uh, to serve them for 16 years. I don't know where I'm going after this. It'll be a new chapter in my life. I've had two chapters now, one in journalism, one as an MP. Who knows what the third chapter will be? Uh, and I wish you, know, I wish you all the best in, in all your endeavours in the future and also my colleagues at the, the next election. Uh, good luck. Thank you.
Thanks, Libby.